Go. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Poonam Patel, and I am with the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. Thank you very much for joining today on this virtual webinar to we'll learn more about our place-based programs and community-based initiatives. Uh, this event is part of our webinar series annually to highlight uh, our accomplishments from economic development partners across the state as they are developing their strategies um, and implementing those locally on ground. Um, as many of you may already be aware, um, Brian, if you go to the next slide. GoBiz is the state's leading entity for job growth, economic development, and business assistance efforts. Uh, we offer a range of services from site selection to incentive navigation, FDI attraction, uh, and small business development support, and permitting assistance. Uh, and we also have a community place-based support team via our California Jobs First initiative, formerly known as SURF, to help support the development of inclusive regional planning um, and, and to help produce regional strategies uh, for economic development efforts that prioritize the creation of high quality jobs uh, in sustainable industries. Uh, for your awareness, this webinar is being recorded and will be distributed to participants after. Uh, we are also going to be posting this webinar on our GoBiz YouTube page in the next couple of weeks. Just to give you a little bit of background on what place-based programs are, what we're going to be talking about today, uh, place-based programs, economic development strategies are initiatives to encourage economic and community development activity in defined geographical areas. They are a set of, de of development strategies that include a variety of approaches to incentivize investment, in disadvantaged communities, including funding for infrastructure and public facilities, job creation and workforce development, affordable housing, and much, much more. Uh, next slide, please. Today, we have a robust agenda for you and a line of speakers eagerly waiting to share their efforts on how they have utilized place-based programs and how those are helping them achieve their economic development goals. Speakers from uh, organizations that we have invited today include the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, La Familia Counseling Center in Sacramento, the Southern California Association of Governments, the City of West Covina, and the Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles. As our audience is muted, we have reserved Q&A sessions after each presentation or set of presentations that's denoted by the orange text on the agenda in front of you. And we will have uh, three opportunities for, uh, for you all, participants, to engage in asking questions. Um, and, and we ask that you please put your questions in the Q&A chat box. Um, that should be found at the bottom of your screen there as an icon. Um, and I will be monitoring, monitoring this chat box and will ask questions to the appropriate speakers during the Q&A sessions that we have. All the present, uh, presenters that we have today have put their contact information at the end of their slides, and we will be providing the slide deck um, as well with uh, participants after, after the event. All right, now to kick us off, we have our Senior Advisor of Business Development, Kaina Pereira. He oversees our business development team, our community place-based solutions team, and our Office of Permitting Assistance. Uh, he's here uh, to help provide some words of wisdom from us and uh, some introdu introductory remarks. Over to you, Kaina. Thank you so much, Poonam, and it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, this is our uh, place-based solutions annual convening, and it was really started as a uh, uh, the salvo, if you will, into the Opportunity Zones program and an extension of the Promise Zones program. But as we've noticed, both on the federal and the state side, a number of economic development and workforce development related projects are taking on this place-based style. As you can see from the IIJA and IRA, as well as the Community Economic Resilience Fund on the state side, we're really targeting our communities in a more robust fashion, trying to be more boots on the ground. And with that effort, our team over at GOBIS has expanded to have an even more entrenched uh, team in all of our communities. And with the 13 regions established under the Community Economic Resilience Fund, we're really trying to accelerate this place-based momentum into a bunch of different other opportunities for more localized and regionalized economic and workforce development. 
And so as, as you'll see in the program coming up, these efforts have been underway for a number of years, but have been taking on a different kind of steam and a, a lot more invigoration within the local communities themselves. And we're gonna hear some of the best practices and some of the opportunities that are gonna come in the future and how these state programs align with federal programs and how multiple sources of funds can be used to get these projects that our economic development folk are really interested in doing to enhance the investability of their communities. And so with that, I'll go ahead and kick it back to Putum, and I'm really excited to hear a lot of the amazing information that is going to be presented today, and also to follow up with all of you on those efforts that you're doing both regionally and locally, and how we can assist in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Kaina. All right, to start us off, we are going to start with HUD, um, and that is the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, as mentioned before. And uh, we're going to start with um, Eduardo Cabrera and Danette Martin. Eduardo Cabrera is a field office director for Northern California with HUD, and Danette Martin is a senior program analyst and community li liaison for the Southern California area. Um, they are going to be providing us with a promise zone update, and we'll be sharing information on the department's climate resilience programs and efforts as well. Danette and Eduardo, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Poonam. Ed Cabrera here. Uh, pleasure to join you on behalf of HUD and bring you greetings from our regional administrator, Jason Poo, and uh, Dr. Michael Huff, who some of you may, uh, I'm sure, work have worked with. Uh, HUD, as you know, uh, is committed on a variety of fronts, but particularly committed to partnering with our state. Uh, with you all, uh, our state partners and, and local communities to execute on HUD's mission. Uh, and we do this by, of course, investing in place-based strategies and approaches and by supporting uh, hyper-local activities and engagements that really are aimed to incentivize investment in disadvantaged or otherwise underserved uh, areas. Uh, and that includes really efforts to expand opportunity uh, for funding uh, in uh, public and green infrastructure, uh, job creation and workforce development, uh, affordable and workforce housing options, and more. Uh, for instance, nearly a decade ago, HUD launched our Promise Zone initiative in Sacramento that continues to this day. And since then, we've worked with them and adapted to increase investment in that community uh, we've um, prioritized work through opportunity zones uh, in the state and in that area. We've pivoted when COVID hit and uh, worked to coordinate clinics. Uh, we've uh, held sign-up events for the Affordable Connectivity Program and have also engaged uh, when it comes to Section 3 and workforce empowerment. Uh, HUD also plays a role in furthering healthy homes and uh, mitigating lead hazards in communities. And most recently, uh, thanks to the work of, of uh, Dr. Huff here at HUD and others, uh, as well as those of you in, our, in, in, in the community, uh, we are pivoting to focus on issues involving greater climate resiliency. And uh, I'm, I'm excited that you'll be hearing from our, our local partner in Sacramento, who's been a, a, a pivotal part of our climate resiliency hub there. Uh, uh, and with that, I'll, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Danette Martin, who has more to share with you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity, GoBiz, to share just an update on where we are with the Promise Zones. As many of you know, Promise Zones are a 10-year commitment to engage in place-based collective work. California is in a unique position because we have four Promise Zones in the state of California, the Sacramento Promise Zone, the San Diego Promise Zone, the Los Angeles Promise Zone, and Slate Z, which is the South Los Angeles Promise Zone. One of the things I wanted to highlight as one of our major successes is our collaboration with AmeriCorps. We've had a commitment through AmeriCorps. This AmeriCorps commitment provides us with 10 years of support for each of the Promise Zones. So that includes an AmeriCorps leader 
and four or more AmeriCorps members. And this has been really essential because it provides the human capital that's needed to carry out the collective vision and common work of our Promise Zones. So I did wanna highlight that at the outset and just recommend that others in this space consider partnering with AmeriCorps. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> One of the things I want to talk about a little bit is our Los Angeles Promise Zone. Our Los Angeles Promise Zone will come to its conclusion this January 9th of 2024. And as a part of that culmination, we're celebrating over 77 grants being received by the Promise Zone and $319 million in federal funding to carry out economic development projects education projects, public safety, and other community developments. As a part of this, one of the things that we've been thinking about, next slide, is what the continuation of this work looks like after the designation ends. And we're proud to say that, South, that the Los Angeles Promise Zone is really thinking about how to continue its work in the area of youth education and development and build on some of the successes of programs that they already have in place that have involved their Promise Zone partners. The Los Angelino Corps, which was a part of funding that came from California All In to hire 450 youth between the ages of 18 and 30. This was a, twin, a 10 month service learning and education program. And it really gave young people the opportunity to get work experience, mentoring, and some professional development assistance. As a part of that, the Promise Zone partners made up eight of the 34 sites, and this gave an opportunity for 71 youth to participate in the program and receive job training and um, also career development. Another project was their Students to Student Success Program. As an outcome of COVID, one of the things that was recognized is how much learning loss had occurred during the COVID period. So this program actually provided a modest stipend for students to mentor other children in their household to help them catch up on their learning loss. We thought this was really critical because it covered an opportunity also to give career exploration um, opportunities for those young people who are considering going into the field of education and childcare. And with that project, we had um, four of the Promise Zone schools participate and 61 youth from the Promise Zone. Next slide. One of the things that we're looking forward to as a continuation of the Promise Zone is that All In has provided the city of Los Angeles with $53 million to continue its employment um, opportunities for youth. This will give the city capacity to place over 4,000 youth in job experiences. And it will also give the Promise Zone the opportunity to develop 10 additional projects. So we're really excited about this as we come to the conclusion of the designation for the Los Angeles Promise Zone. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about the Sacramento um, Promise Zone. Next slide. One of the keys for working with um, the Promise Zones has been that the Promise Zones usually engage in um, around 70 to 100 partners in this work. And they're working on a common set of goals and objectives around issues of education, healthcare, public safety, uh, workforce opportunities, and business development. And so as a part of that work, one of the challenges is just the funding that's needed to carry out these efforts. And one of the best practices that San Diego has developed is they've entered into a partnership with California Coast Credit Union. And as a part of this partnership, they're able to offer an opportunity to their implementation partners to apply for grants of $1,500 to $20,000. This is all designed around building the capacity of these community organizations, helping them with their community outreach, helping them with addressing barriers specifically to secondary education and employment, and also advancing the goals and objectives 
of the actual promise zone. And so one of the beautiful things about this has been that up over the first two years of this five-year commitment, they've allocated $190,000 to 17 community organizations. And they have two more years as a part of this. And we think this is a really good practice in terms of having private partners who are willing to invest in carrying out the work of place-based initiatives. Next slide, please. Let's talk about the Slate Z Promise Zone. The Slate Z Promise Zone was initially um, designed as a way for a Promise Zone to leverage the transit opportunities in South of Los Angeles. Over the last um, decade plus, Los Angeles has invested a lot in transit and rail service. And those rail services run through the core of the South Los Angeles Promise Zone. Next slide. And so what the South Los Angeles Promise Zone has really been looking at is how to leverage this space around transit, environment, and also economic and job opportunities and education opportunities. And so their focus has been on preparing South LA residents and businesses for the new green economy, achieving true sustainability in South Los Angeles by leveraging the historic investments that both the federal government and the state government is making in the area of climate mitigation and climate resilience. Also, facilitating opportunities for their community to engage in business and educational opportunities around the green sector. So this is everything from fostering job creation, mobilizing community involvement, looking at wellness as a way, as one of the outcomes of investment in green communities. Next slide, please. And so I wanna just highlight um, three of the major wins that the South Los Angeles Promise Zone has had. One of the most important ones to highlight is the Rail to Rail project. The Rail to Rail project was envisioned initially in 2012 before the Promise Zone had been established. And it was designed to take a rail spur along the Slauson corridor and convert that into a walkable space, a place where people could bike and to add also new green space in an area that really has very few green spaces and is park deficient. And so what the Promise Zone has been effective at doing is supporting that effort. That project now has been fully funded for the rail to rail portion along the Slauson corridor that brought in one point, I'm sorry, that brought in $140 million. It's scheduled to open um, 2020. And this is a real example of how our promise zones are partnering with local um, public transit, in this case, the Los Angeles Metro, and partnering with other groups that are interested in repurposing transit spaces that are no longer needed for um, things like a railway. And how do we repurpose those in underserved communities so that they have a better um, impact over the long term? The next thing that um, Slate, D, Slate Z has done in this space is it received a um, Transforming Climates Community um, Implementation Grant following receiving a planning grant. And we're really excited about this too, because it's going to give the South LA community an opportunity to do some really creative things. The project is going to be called the South Los Angeles Eco Lab. The project will include planting 10,000 shaded trees, installing um, EV chargers and solar roofs on housings, also expanding um, car sharing and the um, LADOT bike sharing library. It will also give an opportunity for 10,000 plus residents who live in the area to um, participate in a free LA Metro Pass program. And there'll be an added component of um, free tenant rights training for residents in the area. 
And this is a collaboration with the South Los Angeles Commons. It brings together 18 partners across the Promise Zone, including organizations like, of course, the City of Los Angeles, the Coalition for Responsible Community Development, Tree People, LADOT, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, Metro, Community Partners, and many others. The other key win that the South Los Angeles um, Promise Zone has had is the receipt of funding for its Sustaining Transit Equity Project. And this is a grant of $13 million, which will also leverage another $8 million from the city. The primary grantee for the project is LADOT, but it's in collaboration with the Promise Zone. And this will add things like universal mobility, giving free passes and other ways for local residents to utilize the transit system. It also will expand the e-bike um, library. It will make available electric sh shuttle opportunities and a variety of other um, community efforts around transportation in Los Angeles that focuses on zero admissions. Let's go to the next slide. I want to talk a little bit about the Sacramento Promise Zone. Next slide. The Sacramento Promise Zone also had some lessons learned from the um, COVID period. They had already had a partnership with the Sacramento Literacy Foundation focused on helping young children with after school programs, especially in communities that are underserved and underfunded. And one of the things they've engaged in is a series of programming activities over, um, a, a, over the period of time where young people had a learning loss due to COVID. This included giving families free books. It included doing a summer reading initiative and also a science reading lab. And so these are some of the highlights of our Promise Zones. Um, each of the designations will start to come to a closure. As I said, the Los Angeles Promise Zone will conclude in January. The Sacramento Promise Zone will conclude in 2025. And then the Los An the um, San Diego and the Los Angeles Promise Zones will conclude in 2026. Next slide. One of the partners of the Sacramento Promise Zone is La Familia um, Counseling Center. They've been doing some really creative work around creating resilience hubs. They've just recently received a grant of $5 million from the California Department of Food and Agriculture to begin to build out its resilience work focused on emergency responsiveness and resilience and disaster preparedness. And I'd like to introduce Rachel Rios, who is the executive director of Let. I'm sorry, La Familia Counseling Center to do an introduction for that component. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rachel Rios. And um, as Jeanette said, I am the executive director of La Familia Counseling Center. We are a nonprofit that has been in the Sacramento area for 50 years. We just celebrated our 50 years, um, providing services to the community. Um, I'm going to just do a quick introduction about all of the programs that we um, provide or many of the programs that we provide, and then um, turn it over to Dr. Jesus Hernandez, who has been our partner working on how we can really transform our community and our projects around resiliency and climate resiliency. So as, as I indicated, La Familia has been um, in the Sacramento area for over 50 years. We are located in South Sacramento um, on Franklin Boulevard, a street that was identified by our newspaper as the ugliest street in Sacramento. And so our goal is to transform that and to create resources in this community. We um, 
we are, we have two sites. We have a, our main site um, where we provide services, parenting services. We are a career center, one of America's job centers. We are a mental health clinic at our Maple Neighborhood Center, which is our second site. Our second site is a closed elementary school that we repurposed into a neighborhood center, bringing in other partners to be able to provide services that the community indicated they needed. And what we did is we walked our neighborhood and asked them what kind of services were they were they needing? What were the gaps in the neighborhood? And quite honestly, there are a lot of gaps in our neighborhood. This is a neighborhood that doesn't have the infrastructure, that doesn't have um, the beautiful tree-lined streets. And so our effort is to try and address some of those issues. We provide services to older adults. We provide services to young people. We have a STEM lab. We have um, a variety of programs and services, health services, mental health, as I said, we are a mental health clinic, and um, again, just services to the entire community. One of the things that really pushed a lot of our work, we've been doing a lot of this work around place-based strategies for over 10 years, looking at the research and looking at neighborhoods with Dr. Hernandez um, leading the way with our business district. But during the pandemic, what we recognized is that community members went to those trusted partners. They went to the places where they felt comfortable, where they knew that they could talk to someone in a language that they understood and that were, were culturally responsive. And so through this pandemic, La Familia was able to test over 34,000 people to vaccinate close to 8,000 people and provide you know, many more thousands of dollars of resources and food distribution. And that really pushed us to really look at ourselves as being a resiliency hub and being the hub for the community and the neighborhood. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Hernandez to talk about our bigger strategy, and then we'll come back and talk about some of the specific projects that we're doing um, at the Neighborhood Center. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, transforming a neighborhood is not a simple task as we all know. And so what I want to do here is put that challenge into a context. And on one hand, we have a series of overlapping conditions of crisis, uh, crisis conditions in healthcare, education, and the tons of environmental hazards, loss of economic productivity as, as money moves away from the inner city. We have loss of jobs. We've got this COVID problem. We got a punitive immigration policies in a in a neighborhood that primarily consists of immigrant populations, and we have this pub decaying public infrastructure that is so old we can't do anything with. On the other hand, we have this mandated general plan update from SB one thousand that really targets strategies for disadvantaged communities, although there is not a lot of context that tells municipalities what to do. Although they're supposed to reduce pollution and improve air quality and food access and create good housing, there's really no clear strategies on how to do this, especially at the neighborhood level, which is what SB 1000 is really trying to get at, that disadvantaged community. Next slide, please. So, you know, for us, the unit of analysis is the neighborhood because they are designed to support people and everything that happens in these locations. That public infrastructure investment is really designed to support a place. It's not based on individuals. But the problem is, is this public support system has been compromised over a hundred years of racialized policies and economic and racial exclusion. And the result has been these clear patterns of, of racial and economic segregation that we will see in any major city in our state. And so these economic differences between neighborhoods really reflect differences in the level of public investment. And so our goal is to assess these neighborhoods and assess those support systems so that we can identify and understand this hundred years of cumulative trauma that has really shaped neighborhoods in a very a punitive way. And as we do this assessment, it gives us, it, it acts as a guide for creating this vision and design solutions that neighborhoods need at the neighborhood level. Next slide, please. 
So our first task is to do this triage of our patient, the neighborhood, you know, and we look at social determinants because the neighborhood is the first place where you access your social determinants, employment, education, housing, healthcare, and they're all interrelated because, you know, you get your health insurance from your employment and you get your employment from that, you know, your level of education, et cetera. So you can see how all these, these social determinants are interdependent. And so we look at the public infrastructure because that gives us the access to those social determinants, the soft infrastructure, the policies of how the funding happens. And that hard infrastructure, the physical connect connectivity, the broadband, the streets, the roads, the, the transit. And we measure these differences between neighborhoods. And when we document these differences in investments, we can be very clear on the types of actions we need to do. Uh, next slide, please. So how do neighborhoods actually conduct these types of assessments? You know, and so we really need to establish some place-based metrics for each social determinant. This is why we use the neighborhood as a unit of analysis rather than this concept of community that, is, that has no boundaries. And so the idea here is to create functional requirements for evaluating each social determinant in our neighborhood and how we can protect ourselves. And these functional requirements start showing up in terms of like reliability. Is my transit reliable? Can I depend on it? Can I afford it? You know, if it's broken, how do I fix it? What do I fix? And does it create this process of economic productivity without any harm? And does it provide me with a level of resilience in times of calamity? Can we prevent a disaster? Can we recover from it? And does it correct disparate impact problems of the past? And so when we look at these and all of our social determinants through this, we realize that many of the problems that exist are not inherent to the neighborhood, but external to the process of how we fund infrastructure. Next slide, please. And so when we start looking at the results of our assessments, one of the things that we have is a clear vision for what we need to intervene and how we should uh, use assets to rec for recovery. We know what to fix. And then we can start building strategies of how to fix things in a neighborhood. And when we do this, things like vacant lots, like you will see the projects Rachel is working on, they turn into assets. And when we do this, we have a community buy-in because the neighborhood is actually involved in the assessment process. And this also ensures an institutional buy-in. The strategies are consistent with the general plan updates, climate change legislation, any equity, equity mandate that happens across the state. It promotes government and neighborhood partnerships. It brings public health back to the surface and it operationalizes climate change policy on the ground. And most important, and what you will hear from Rachel repeatedly, is that these plans are consistent with the cultures and the communities that are taking place within these neighborhood boundaries. And that's important. Next slide, please. So when you see how we can take these assessments and turn them into transformative strategies, focused on our neighborhood, you will see renewable energy projects, energy efficiency, broadband, clean transit, public space, healthcare access in our neighborhood, cradle to career pathways in housing, education, uh, housing, uh, energy, and healthcare, and technology. And it results in comprehensive housing, energy, and environmental planning, which is key to revitalizing a neighborhood. And it converts blighted properties that have been existing for over 50 years into public assets. And so this is the balance that we're trying to achieve, this equilibrium between them, the environment, the economy, and equity. And this is what sustainability is about. Next slide, please. Okay, now Rachel's going to give you an overview of the exact projects that are happening at her site. 
So thank you, Dr. Hernandez. I think that gives you a, a really good foundation for the work that we've been doing over the last 10 years, engaging our community and looking at how we can really do this with intentionality. Um, and so, you know, I'll just give you a quick description of the projects. We are looking at two sites. Um, we are, our project overview has been to focus on our community and transform not just our facility, but the whole community by be, being able to provide these supportive services. We, we recognize we don't do this work alone, so we have many partners that are working with us in these efforts, but we are looking at two sites. One is the Maple Neighborhood Center, which is um, one of the, the closed schools that I mentioned in 2013 and 14, our school district closed seven schools, all in economically distressed communities. And so we these were hubs for community members. And so we repurposed one of them, the Maple Neighborhood Center. And it is a neighborhood center with about five other organizations that provide services with us there. And then the second site is a lot a vacant lot that's right across the street from the Maple Neighborhood Center. So this will become a whole complex and campus there for our services. Next slide, please. So what will we be doing? Part of the work we'll be doing in terms of creating our resiliency hub is one, being able to have backup power. So when um, we have climate emergency situations, being able to keep our site as a site where we can be a stop, a hub for our city, county, and state officials to be able to access our community. We learned through COVID um, the importance of having these community sites, um, being able to have potable water, converting some of our spaces to be able to have showers and laundry facilities so that if we are um, having to house people for temporary periods of time, we're able to provide them with basic necessities. We um, are including a clinic, a satellite clinic, so we need to have hospital um, grade air filtration, broadband access, and um, opportunity for food storage. Next slide, please. So this is what our resiliency hub will look like. As I mentioned, our Maple Neighborhood Center is already um, in play. It's an elementary school. This is what the new resiliency hub, the, what we're calling the Opportunity Center. And we're calling it the Opportunity Center because what we've learned in working with our communities is that communities just want an opportunity to be able to compete, to be able to be successful. And so that's what this facility will do. We will be able to, as I mentioned, um, have our local um, energy, we'll be able to have disaster preparedness, um, public health support, we are uh, will be able to have electric vehicle charging stations. Um, when Dr. Hernandez talks about cradle to career pathways, Franklin Boulevard is an area where everything you need about cars is on Franklin Boulevard. You want a radio, you want um, new rims, you want a, a sunroof, new upholstery. It's all on Franklin Boulevard. And so as we move to green technology and, and electric vehicles, we want this to also be the place for people to be able to come and get their cars fixed. And so we are working with the business owners to have them learn about electric vehicle repair, working with um, our local community college to be able to bring those classes on site so that we're able to transform the businesses into this new green um, economy. In our Maple Center, next slide, please. In our Maple Center, again, this was a closed elementary school. The back of our school is a soccer field, which we when we um, took the facility, we opened it up and it's a mini park. It's not a park, it's just a field. There's no shade. There's no place for people in this neighborhood to go and recreate when you know we say that we know the importance of health and being able to get, have physical activity. There is no place in our neighborhood, no park. So we will convert the field into a mini park, being able to have shade being able to have trees where people can come out. We know that coming out, trees are actual provide safety as neighbors come out and are shaded. They get to know each other. They provide support for each other. So this is part of the work that we'll be doing in our Maple Neighborhood Center. And um, again, we are part of the Promise Zone. We are part of the Opportunity Zone. Um, we have been working in this area for many years, and we are really grateful for a lot of our partners. As mentioned earlier, we just got a $5 million grant with um, uh, CDFA to be able to 
uh, do this work on our resiliency hub. And we've raised another $5 million. We are still working um, to raise the final, but we are ready to go. And we, this last week, our conditional use permit was granted uh, by city council. So this is a project that is shovel ready and ready to move forward. I think as Dr. Huff said about our project, um, we are vetted, tested, and trusted in the community. And um, I will end with that and open up for any questions. Thank you so very much, Rachel and Dr. Hernandez and our partners at HUD. Um, we really appreciate you guys sharing all these insights on um, everything that you've achieved, which is very impressive. We did have two uh, questions, it looks like, that came into chat that uh, thank you, Eduardo, for addressing already. I'll just um, kind of quickly go through them for um, the rest of our audience here. Um, so Gerbox, uh, thank you for chiming in from Cowled um, and asking the question for HUD uh, to see if there are any considerations for rural and small communities in underserved and disadvantaged areas. Um, and um, you, it looks like you were looking for if there's anything specific that HUD is, is doing for non-entitlement communities with CDBG funds? Uh, I know this is a question we all really care about. So Eduardo, I know you um, answered that for us in chat, but looks like you guys have a new office that's set up to help address um, uh, these kinds of considerations. Would you mind maybe just quickly um, sharing that real quick with the, with the entire audience here? Sure, sure. As I mentioned in the chat, uh, HUD has established a new Office of Disaster Management uh, within the Office of uh, the Deputy Secretary and an Office of Disaster Recovery uh, that sits within our Office of Community Planning and Development. They're, they're the uh, arm of HUD that oversees uh, the administration of HUD's CDBG D D uh, disaster recovery uh, allocations. So when a disaster occurs, uh, and Congress allocates funding to uh, respond to that disaster. Uh, HUD, through what we what we call CPD, uh, administers those funds to to local communities. So on the disaster de disaster front, we're moving to to adjust to the our new realities. Uh, uh, you know, often di driven by climate change, uh, and we've also uh, for the first time have asked. Uh, for feedback from you all and from other members of the public on how to simplify, uh, modernize, and more equitably distribute these funds. So um, uh, certainly there's more on our website. I've included a URL link uh, and certainly you can contact me as well. I've posted my email if you want more. Uh, on the question of entitlements, uh, non-entitlement communities, I'm happy to look into that more for you. I'm not a subject matter expert in that area, but can certainly follow up with you offline to uh, share more and connect you with our, our staff who can speak more intelligently than I on, on that topic. Thank you so much, Eduardo, for addressing that. And the, the next question which we got uh, which was um, asking if the, if there were any plans to continue the promise zones or if they were going to be expiring, which it looks like there are no plans to renew the HUD promise zones, but the ongoing work that your team and other teams are doing to help support those missions are, are still uh, going to be prevalent. Um, and so that was great to hear. Um, and we got, I think, another question um, or a comment uh, glad to hear that there are a couple of AmeriCorps members from the San Diego Province Zones uh, on with us. And let's see, moving down. Um, we've got a question from Alida. Um, currently preparing to work on an update on our economic development element in Porterville, where 60,000 plus community in rural Tulare County. Any tips on communication and community outreach planning? to ensure cohesiveness, equity, and inclusiveness in initial outreach. The topic feels relevant to topics touched in the presentation as what I as what she saw today and was work on resulting from excellent communication across the partners. Uh, thank you for the kind words, Alita. Um, Eduardo, Rachel, um, any thoughts there, Dr. Hernandez? Yeah, um, Dr. Hernandez, you want to talk a little bit about all the community work? Um, I, I can just say that, 
it is very important to have your community input and that takes on many different forms, right? Um, because you have community members that are active that will come and will talk, but then you have community members that are living in the community that are busy with making dinner and with other things and they can't come to these forums. And so we, um, we engaged community in many different ways. We had different kind of events. We walked the streets. We actually knocked on doors. You know, we got them in the grocery store and really, you know, um, engaged people in the community so that we could get diverse points of view on both young people and um, residents, you know, our older adults, making sure that we were hearing from everyone in the community. It's a long process um, over, you know, many years, Dr. Hernandez got groups of um, college students to come out and help. And then just having a community center in the area or a hub that's in the area where people feel comfortable already going to is a, is a really big um, asset um, for those that are going to start that community engagement. Dr. Hernandez, did I miss any areas there? You're right on point there, Rachel. Uh, when I started doing this work ten, over 10 years ago in the neighborhood, one of the things that I relied upon was the resources that Rachel had to, to uh, get a hold of people immediately in a community. Uh, when we were uh, passing out surveys to people to, to interview with, and Rachel's staff was right there in two different languages, uh, walking people through this process. And one of the things that I want to point out is this just wasn't a, a type of venture where you go out and, and just present something to your community. What we did is actually involve people in the neighborhood in the research. You know, we had people, I had people getting on buses at seven in the morning figuring out where they got off on, where, where they got on the bus, where they got off the bus to see how our transportation systems work. We had people walking the streets. Matter of fact, half of Rachel's uh, team was walking the streets with the uh, Walk Sacramento to understand and to give data, to come up with data on, you know, the, the things that are going wrong on the, just walking down the street and crossing the street and things of that sort. And so there was a lot of community involvement in the research to come up with real data so that we can really present a real problem on how this infrastructure of social determinants is not meeting the needs of the neighborhood. And that's when we knew what places to plug in, how to intervene, and the strategies for moving forward. I just will say, and I just put it in the chat, never underestimate the power of the Comadre hotline. People tell people, and if you get those people there and they will tell their comadres, it will go faster than any social media, I'm telling you. And so having those stakeholders in your community, and we all have them, who know what's going on, they know every neighbor, you know, getting them to be part of your team you know, you, we need to compensate our community people, you know, and, and um, help having them help you goes a long way. And it, it goes to that trust because it's someone who they see, they know, and they will believe. So I say the Comadre hotline is, is strong. All right. And we have one last question from Michael, uh, most likely for HUD. Uh, must an eligible place-based economic and workforce development project be located in a promise or opportunity zone? Danette or Ed? I'll chime in and then Danette, please feel free to, to add uh, if I miss anything. Um, uh, in terms of HUD funding, no, not necessarily. I think um, uh, certainly if your project or initiative does uh, uh, overlap or, or fall in a promise zone or opportunity zone, it's certainly worth mentioning in your grant applications or looking in, into uh, how that uh, may affect the community. But uh, yeah, HUD, HUD funding isn't limited to a particular community, uh, including promise zones. Danette. And I would just add to what Ed was saying. I think the only ways that it's kind of relevant is if you wanna leverage, if there are preference points, in a HUD or other federal grant, often those preference points will include things like the promise zone or opportunity zones 
or historically black colleges or minority serving institutions. So you wanna be attentive to federal funding that gives some additional points in the evaluation process to communities that are tied to those types of initiatives. Makes sense, wonderful. Okay, we had another question come in from Clay, um, but if, if Rachel, if you wouldn't mind answering that live for us, um, the question is addressed to you. I wanna make sure we can stay on time. We're gonna move on to our next set of speakers. Um, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to put those in Q and A. Our speakers can address them live in the chat box. Um, okay, and uh, also wanted to uh, congratulate La Familia again for celebrating 50 years. Um, and really glad to hear that, so congrats. Okay, mm -hmm. we're gonna move on then um, to our next uh, presenter. David Kiobi, who's a senior regional planner at the uh, Southern California Association of Governments, or SCAD. And David's gonna be talking us through the nuts, nuts and bolts of setting up an enhanced infrastructure financing district and the challenges and learnings they encountered along the way. Hey, thank you so much, Poonam. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is David Kiobi. I'm a senior regional planner in SCAG's housing department, um, where I help manage the regional early action planning program with funds provided by HCD. Um, I have to do this plug in every presentation. The Skag region encompasses six counties, Imperial, Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, and Ventura, and 191 cities in an area covering more than 38,000 square miles. So we're a pretty big MPO. Some of the projects we fund are tax increment financing studies and assessments, which is why I'm here today. Um, next slide, please. So today I'll provide you some background on the Regional Early Action Planning Program that funds SCAG's EIFD work with our partners. I'll provide you with an overview of EIFDs and wrap up by highlighting some of the work uh, we have done uh, in the region with EIFDs. Next slide. So SCAG was awarded $47 million in Regional Early Action Planning funding from Assembly Bill 101 to provide housing planning process improvements as well as service to cities and counties. Um, the funding was organized in these four uh, large streams. Um, one was the Partnership and Outreach for $31 million, where we helped fund projects for our local council of governments. The other was the Regional Housing Policy Solutions, um, which funded housing-related research, partnerships with universities such as USC. And then we also had our Sustainable Community Strategy Integration Funding Program, which was worth about $9.3 million. And this found that funded a lot of projects related to our Sustainable Communities Program, transit-oriented development, as well as EIFDs. And then finally, we had um, our other bucket, which funds all our work related to regional housing needs assessment. Uh, next slide, please. getting there, David. Oh, no worries. There we go. Um, so in 2014, with Senate Bill 628, the state revamped the existing infrastructure financing districts into what is called enhanced infrastructure financing districts. And EIFDs are specialized financing districts formed by either a county or city in California. They operate within specific boundaries and leverage future increases in property taxes to fund um, various public infrastructure projects, such as streets, utilities, open houses, and especially important to SCAG is affordable housing. Um, EIFDs do not require voter approval to form. However, if 55% voter approval is required for the issuance of EIFD bonds. 
Um, so when a new construction development occurs within the AIFD boundaries, a portion of the property tax generated by that new project is allocated to a special EIFD fund. So at the bottom of the slide here, it just lays out the process of how this happens. So um, you have a private property investment or new development. This results in increased property tax revenue from the new property value, which is then deposited in a separate EIFD fund. And like I said, the fund then pays for um, public improvements. And I do want to note that the EIFD is not a new tax. Um, next slide, please. So here's some sort of key facts about EIFDs. So they're long-term financing districts. So um, they last 45 years from the first bond issuance. Um, they're managed by a public financing authority that implements an approved um, infra infrastructure financing plan that also has a list of projects um, that can be funded. Uh, usually these projects are identified in uh, master plans or uh, specific area plans for jurisdictions. And um, when they're formed, you need to have a mandatory public hearing um, with a protest opportunity, but there isn't a public vote. Um, EFD areas do not have to be contiguous, which is a big advantage of them. So you could have um, you know, various parts of your jurisdiction within an EIFD, but they don't have to be one geographic contiguous area. Um, forming an EIFD takes approximately 18 to 24 months and um, like I said before, they can collect and spend the property tax increment for up to 45 years after the first bond is issued. Next slide, please. Um, so here we just have an example of some of the projects EIFDs can fund. Um, they range quite widely from road and highway improvements, um, parking facilities, transit stations, sewage and water facilities, childcare, affordable housing, and uh, brownfield remediation. So there's quite a large number of uh, projects that EIFDs uh, can fund. Uh, next slide, please. So what are some of the challenges of EIFDs? Um, so one of them is that EFDs require a degree of seating of authority from local legislative bodies to a state financing authority. Um, the shift removes some control from local jurisdictions and places in the hands of a broader state entity. And for some jurisdictions, this can lead to concerns about local oversight as well as decision making. Um, additionally, the administration of EIFDs can be cumbersome and expensive. So you have to manage the administrative funds. You need to have a person on board who um, looks over the project oversight and then funding allocation and other aspects involve significant resources that um, can pose a challenge when you want to efficiently execute um, an EIFD. Um, there's also at times unclear delineation of authority and responsibility between the state and local authorities and this can create confusion about who holds the ultimate decision-making power leading to potential conflicts and inefficiencies and disagreements. Um, and um, EIF, EIFDs utilize multiple, if EIFDs that utilize multiple parcels require the establishment of a joint power authority involving various stakeholders such as cities, counties, and potentially other entities. And you do have that negotiation between the parties uh, with competing interests, and this can further complicate the process and add layers of complexity um, to EIFDs. Next slide, please. So in terms of EIFDs in the SCAG region, um, SCAG's REIT program has funded several. Um, the goal of us funding these was to provide planning assistance and help jurisdictions form um, these EIFDs. Um, the projects that we funded call for programs that are tied specifically to accelerating housing production, meeting community need, and also serve as best practices for other cities in the region. Um, next slide, please. So here I just have like an overview of some of the EAFD's assessments that we funded in the last uh, two years or so. So within Los Angeles County, we have our star uh, city of Covina that um, did a really good job of, of, of establishing the EAFD. And we have Alana Spectre today here, I believe, who's going to talk about the process about establishing that. We have the LAC, LAC USC Health Village, the Hardy Hollywood, one San Pedro, and then in Imperial County, we have 
the county of Imperial that's focusing on a more sort of rural-based EIFE surrounded around the Lithium Valley project. And then in San Bernardino County, we have the city of Ukaipa as well as the city of Barstow. Um, next slide, please. Um, so that's it for me. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you so much, David. And um, now we are going to transition to the city of Covina. Um, and they're going to be sharing a little bit with us about their implementation of their EIFD, the process they, that they um, endeavored upon to create align, alignments um, in larger regional efforts um, and uh, the learning they made along the way too. Um, and with us to present today, we have Alana Spector, Senior Management Analyst, and Brian Lee, Director of Community Development, City of Covina. Thank you both so much. Thank you for having us today. We're very excited and thank you, David, um, for the praise. We were really excited to work with SCAG. Um, next slide, please. So just a little bit about the city of Covina. Um, we're about 22 miles east of downtown Los Angeles. As you can see, um, we do not have regular borders. Um, we have quite a bit of unincorporated LA County within our jurisdiction, um, or I should say mixed within what would be our jurisdiction. We're in between two major freeways, um, the 210 freeway on the north and the 10 freeway um, just directly south of us. We also have quite a few colleges within our immediate area. Um, and our population at the last census was about 50,000. We're about seven square miles large and our median household income is right around 82,000. So um, these numbers have stayed relatively steady uh, over the last few years, but we do have a lot going on. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we were asked, of course, to speak here. And so we can't be in front of all these people without bragging a little bit about ourselves. But I also would like to give you a little bit of background as to what we already have going on. Um, all of the pictures that you see here are within our EIFD boundaries. So uh, this time last year, we were lucky enough to bring the Laugh Factory into the city of Covina, um, we proactively purchased a theater and did a partnership with the Laugh Factory, which you can see on the upper left corner. Um, and one of the nexus sites that we have in our EIFD area is Campsite Brewing, which is this lovely brewery you can see in the upper middle. Um, they spent millions of dollars revitalizing it and it's right along the Metrolink train tax. We have a Metrolink stop in the city. And as you'll see um, below uh, with the cars and the people, we have a annual event called Thunderfest um, where uh, this year we had 10,000 attendees um, and this is for classic cars. It's a really, really well attended event. We have a lot of involvement from our parks and recreation department. This year for our tree lighting ceremony, we had 3000 people and for the parade that we just had this past weekend, we had 15,000. So. Um, we really do invest ourselves in our community. I mean, we're only 50,000 people, but uh, we really try to keep people engaged and have a reason to stay in Covina. And something that we're really excited about is right along the Metrolink train tracks through a development agreement, we were able to acquire a two and a half acre parcel for an upcoming recreation center. So it'll be about a $25 million project, which is largely uh, grant funded. It will house um, our Parks and Recreation Department, as well as a new library, um, rock climbing wall, dog park, outdoor activities, um, native gardens. So those are the renderings that you can see on the right hand side. So we're very excited, obviously, about what we have going on already within the boundaries of our EIFD. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Alana. Um for the introduction, just to provide the uh, the group with some um, contents. Um, the image on the left is the uh, uh, Covina Town Center specific plan. And the image on the right is the EIFD boundaries that the city just recently adopted for our EIFD. So a little bit of context and background. So the town center specific plan was first adopted in 2004. It was essentially a, um, architectural design guideline plan 
Um, it has subsequently been amended a number of times to actually make it a zoning document. And the most recent update is, was a, approved in 2019 in its current form. Um, the city received a Metro grant, LA Metro grant to um, help pay for the consulting uh, firm that helped the city with that in uh, 2015. And it um, uh, involved a considerable amount of public outreach and the ultimate um, plan is on the left that it also embraces not only the historic core of the downtown, but also some of the surrounding areas around it. Um, so we expanded the boundaries of the town center specific plan to also include the Metrolink station that's on the very um, northerly portion of the uh, of the specific plan. And also we expanded, extended to the south and also included the hospital district to the west. So part of that effort was um, as a result of the demise of redevelopment in California in 2012. So prior to that, cities and counties used redevelopment as an economic development tool to finance uh, projects. They range from shopping centers and what have you. Uh, but when that went away, um, you know, and redevelopment was a was a sometimes a controversial um, tool, but when that went away, a huge amount of economic um, development went away with it. And so for a while, cities did not know what to do. Um, um, the state legislature in 2014 adopted the EIFD legislation. Um, that kind of was sitting dormant for a while. A few cities were tire kicking on that. Uh, but uh, as part of trying to continue economic development activity, Cities started to do a couple things. One, to incentivize zoning, to uh, create attraction for developers to come in and businesses to come in. So there was that model in our town center specific plan has done that. On um, the other um, tool that cities are beginning to embrace and look at more closely is the EIFD, which Covina has um, just very recently adopted. One of the elements of our town center specific plan is transforming development. Um, so that was the primary reason that we got the Metro grant. So we have um, embraced um, a lot of the mixed use um, projects that are around our historic core. So Covina is a very old town that established back in 20, uh, 1901. Um, so a lot of our downtown uh, buildings along the historic Citrus Avenue are your classic two-story brick uh, buildings that uh, are you know that were built in the 20s through the 50s uh so from an architectural and land use perspective our developments need to be sensitive to that and also encourage um the uh you know further investment so we have probably um about between approved and built to in the pipeline about 500 units within the boundaries of the specific plan that has either been constructed, under construction, or has submitted applications for, which I think has probably contributed to um, Covina's recent revitalization efforts, um, attracting the Laugh Factory, uh, some of the businesses that, that have come into Covina because of the um, additional rooftops within walking distance of, of um, you know, all these uh, businesses. So the uh, EIFD boundaries was to help complement that. So we looked at a tool to, uh, to as a companion, in, in addition to the zoning incentives, um, the EIFD provided us with an opportunity um, when we have enough bonding capacity that we'll be able to, to uh, create a funding stream to do projects within these boundaries to assist with the, with the economic development of, of Covina. Uh, it, if we would have done this probably five years ago, we could have used some of the bonding capacity to help with, with our, our recreation village project. But um, we do think that is going to be a, a good tool and we're really bullish on that. Next slide, please. So uh, this slide has the SCAG uh, Sustainable Communities goals on the left-hand side. Um, and on the right hand side is our town center specific plan goals. So as you can see that those two goal statements 
kind of aligned very nicely and is, you know, coincidental because we adopted our specific plan in 2019 um, without, without thinking of at that time an EIFD. So in looking at, um, you know, how to finance some of the things that we wanted to do, um, we turned to the EIFD, but of course at that point in time, it's expensive to, you know, get the subject matter experts to assist the city with the EIFD formation process. So we applied for a SCAG grant um, to help us do that. And so that's how we got involved with the SCAG in this program. Um, SCAG uh, provided us with the funding to hire Cosmot um, to assist the city with the formation of the EI EIFD. And so that's what we have done with um, uh, to complement and to grow our downtown. Next slide. So David touched a little bit before um, about the timeline of creating an EIFD. And as we're well aware, and as you can hear from, you know, sort of the Nexus sites and obviously the Town Center specific plan, um, this is the timeline just for the EIFD establishment. But a lot of work went into, you know, having a place that could actually be promising before we ever got to this point. So prior to us applying for the SCAG grant, we had done some preliminary uh, research with a different consulting company to see, is this even maybe feasible to, to create an EIFD? And, and we were told, yes, we think it's feasible. So that gave us a little bit of confidence in moving forward. Um, so in May 2021, we accepted the grant award from SCAG for the Sustainable Communities Program. Um, and something that worked really well with SCAG and that I think is helpful for small cities or, or agencies that are pressed on, on staffing is SCAG managed the payment and the contract with the consulting company directly, um, which obviously just makes it a lot easier for the cities who are receiving it. Um, and one of the things that we really liked as well is that SCAG, um, we were also bundled with two other agencies that received um, or that were working to uh, establish an EIFD. And we were able to participate in the interviews of potential consultants, um, which I think was really great because we had a lot of confidence in who we would be working with. So um, we had our first kickoff meeting with Cosmon in January of 2022. Um, from there, we had a stakeholder meeting, um, public workshops, and then in October, our council officially authorized us to move forward with establishing an EIFD. And you'll notice quite a big break um, in between October and September. That's not for a lack of work being done. Um, quite the opposite. There's quite a bit of meetings that need to occur. There's three public hearings that you have to have with your newly established um, public financing authority. So um that's a whole other step you have to create a new um a new oversight body um we had to go to planning commission um to get their approval that this uh aligned with our general plan goals um we have to get some city council input throughout the way so there's meetings happening you know almost every month if not more often um in between this time frame but as you can see by september of 2023 our EIFD was officially formed and we were able to send our formation documents to the Board of Equalization. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, I messed up a little bit. Um, so there are challenges with forming an EIFD. Um, number one, it takes a lot of time. Uh, as you can hear, there's a lot of meetings that need to occur. Um, we spent a lot of time going back and forth with Cosmont. Um, they were really great at, at getting everything done. It's just even when things are going absolutely perfectly, it's still a really involved process. Um, and you have to prepare everyone involved that if you're not getting money, of course, right away because we're looking to have bonding capacity. We're doing this as a favor to our future selves. So um, this requires a bit of patience. Um, the other thing is there are other agencies and we, when we initially went into this process, we were hoping to have a joint city county um, EIFD, uh, like I know city of Placentia in Orange County has that and we were hoping to as well. Um, 
but the county had other things going on in the office that would have been, you know, working with us and they weren't able to commit to this partnership at the time that we needed it. Um, so we, we were really at a crossroads with deciding, do we move forward or do we wait for the county? Because we were, you know, kind of in a holding pattern with them. And when you form an EIFD, um, and I'll let SCAG or if anyone has questions for Cosmont, they can answer. But generally speaking, there's three ways you can form an EIFD to my knowledge. You as a city or a public agency can go it alone and form it so that you're the one that's going to be um, running it from the get and that's the only option. You can also form it so that you're the one forming the EIFD, which is what we've done, but you leave it open. There's specific legal language which allows for um, the county to join at a later date if they were to um, be open to it. Or from the very beginning, you can do the city county partnership. So the way that we chose was to move forward, but to allow there to be the opportunity for the county to join at a later date. Um, but, you know, there's imperfect decision making. We're moving forward without a for sure answer. Um, the other part of this is, of course, staff education and public education. Um, you've heard, I believe it was Brian, um, talk about redevelopment and you know, I think something that we need to be cognizant of is that there's people like me who, you know, may have been quite young realistically when redevelopment went away. So maybe our only understanding of redevelopment is from the successor agency side of it, or maybe there's not much knowledge at all. So I think um, recognizing that just saying, oh, it's like redevelopment light, you know, maybe that's not the best way to put it. There might need to be some more concerted staff education because, we might not know at all what redevelopment really looked like when it was in its heyday. Um, and this also goes for the public too. You know, when we had our public workshops, we had people show up, which we were of course very grateful for, but um, reiterating what this district is for and what it's not for is something that you'll have to keep doing. Um, and even within, you know, your elected officials, they, they, they're they not sure what this is either. So there is an education and learning curve involved. Um, and, you know, lastly, the other main challenge and I guess risk of establishing an EIFD is you're, you're choosing an area and you're doing this based on what you believe your district will be. So um, we chose an area that already had quite a few nexus sites. We have the TCSP and the zoning in place. Um, that should allow for good things to happen. And, you know, we have projects that have been submitted and, and things of that nature. But at the end of the day, you do hear about, you know, the economy turning and people walking away. Um, so we hope that the things that we've speculated on and that we, you know, attribute to our future growth will come through, but you don't know for sure. So there's, there's all these levels of risk. Um, and I would say lastly, too, you know, this has definitely got to be a collaboration between many departments within your agency. This can't just be the finance department taking it on because then you'll miss out on all of the knowledge that planning has and, you know, knowing where things are happening and what is going to be coming through the pipeline in these developments. And you can't just have planning do it um, or community development, I should say, because we are not, you know, finance people necessarily. So you need everyone to be on the same page and have equal dedication in order to really make this um, a success. And I would also add that you need to be able to, if you're not getting a grant to do this, um, we were very happy to obviously have this funded by SCAG, but I would recommend don't be a hero. You know, sometimes I think we try to say, oh, well, you know, we could do this ourselves and just, you know, we don't need to hire a consultant. But there's some things that are pretty complicated and it might be worth your time and energy and sanity to hire a consultant to help you do it. Because um, if this isn't what you know, then it, it will be hard to do on your own. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so just a little bit about our EIFD. Um, what we ended up establishing is about, uh, it represents about 5% of our total land area, which is the recommended um, number somewhere around there is what is recommended by Cosmont. Um, and that is 213 acres of land within our city. Um, as I said, since we're going it alone with uh, the establishment at this point, we chose to allocate 50% of our future property tax increment um, 
and you know we'll see if the county ends up joining later on we didn't do any motor vehicle license fees within that number um and you know the uh our, our estimated revenues from the establishment um would be about 27 million um and then which is about 11 million in present value dollars um and it's important to i think when you're choosing where to establish your eifd uh you need to have nexus sites within it and you need to have some level of whether it's you know development that's pushed within your city um you know from a planning perspective or if it's things that are naturally occurring, whatever it may be, I think it will be very difficult to create an EIFD um, in a location that doesn't already have some of this occurring because you have to base this on future growth. And if there isn't anything really happening or it, nothing set up for that, you'll have a hard time predicting what um, those numbers could look like. Next slide, please. So part of the EIFD establishment process is determining what projects you would like to fund, or I should say um, having your public financing authority and your city council um, provide that guidance. Um, so what we uh, prioritize, and this can be updated at the meetings of your PFA um, after you've established, is a regional dispatch center, um, an emergency operations center. Um, something that we're heavily invested in is um, spurring or, or creating a FAIR district, and FAIR stands for food, arts, industry, and residential. Um, so kind of think of like an arts district type of location, um, which is where the brewery uh, currently is. Um, we'd like to expand our parks. Um, we're really hoping to do a lot more with pedestrian connectivity, um, walkability, especially because we already have the Metrolink station. Um, you know, this is important to us, and, and we do think it's the future, and you know, this will really help us with our environmental goals and everything related to TOD. Um, funding utility infrastructure, you know, obviously we want to make our area as friendly to um, incoming developers as possible. So whatever we can do to kind of incentivize is important. And then lastly, affordable housing support, um, you know, being creative with what you're wanting to see in your city. Um, we're very big on live workspace. Um, we want to create maker spaces um, so that people can walk to and from where they need to be, kind of try to uh, move away from the reliance on cars and move towards walking and public transportation. So these are the goals of our EIFD, um, but there's quite a few, I think, like David was saying, that you can choose from that fall within this. So um, I know like brownfield remediation is another one for cities that may have more open land area. So um, yeah, this is what we've gone with. Uh, next slide, please. So this uh, slide are images of of the content of the town center specific plan. So um, we're showing this as kind of um, when the city started the town center specific plan update in 2015, part of the heavy lift was that we needed to have the community involved and buy into the vision, the future vision of what we were trying to accomplish. So these images here are, um, these are not Gomia. These are images that our consulting firm that helped us uh, prepare the update uh, provided as kind of inspiration panels um, and to tell the community to in visual format as to what, what you know, the flavor, if you will, of what we were trying to accomplish. Um, so like Alana mentioned, the fair district, uh, one portion of um, of the of a neighborhood that is immediately north of the downtown, just south of the Metrolink tracks, is kind of an older um, quasi-industrial, early automotive repair cent centric area that um, <clears throat> doesn't look real great, uh, but uh, we've visualize that this can be something if we encourage an arts district type of an approach that could be a complement to our downtown. Um, we had our first success with the uh, um, the brewery that opened up that took an old um, packing house. Uh, Povina was um, historically a, a very vibrant um, citrus packing um, area within the East San Gabriel Valley. So that old packing house was converted into the microbrewery with um, um, the immediately adjacent 
a former parking area becoming part of the outdoor grounds. So that's a catalyst site within the uh, uh, parameters of the downtown specific plan that we think will be able to be leveraged into other things. But this these documents um, um, helped to sell it. And so part of how the community embraced the EIFD was not as much of a lift as it may have could have been because they already embraced the town, down, town center specific plan. And this was a, a financing tool um, that the community understood to help with um, the, you know, to realize the, some of the goals that the community embraced with the town center specific plan. And that helped immensely to um, um, reduce any potential public um, concerns. Matter of fact, our EIF, EIFD public hearing and community outreach process went extraordinarily smooth. Um, so next slide, please. So, so that um, kind of is our experience, but one of the things just to kind of summarize on um, uh, what Alana has said and what I've said is that part of communicating to the public what the EIFD is, is as much as communicating to them to what it isn't. And so you'll have property owners in the community that remember redevelopment. Um, and so when you start tax, talking about tax increment, um, immediately that sends up some red flags as to what that could mean. Um, obviously redevelopment involved the potential for eminent domain as for economic development purposes. So then when that went away, um, um, that tool went away. Cities still retain the, the power of eminent domain for public projects. Um, many people don't realize that. But part of in communicating to um, your long-term um, residents about the EIFD is telling them that it is not the old redevelopment. So those powers of old redevelopment agencies do not exist with EI with the EIFD. Um, it's important to tell them that there are no new taxes. Um, it's essentially just property tax that they're already paying going into a different bucket to be leveraged for future bonding capacity within the boundaries of the EIFD. So as long as the 50% of the property tax that is generated is going to the EIFD and those are, are within the boundaries of that. So that other areas of the city are not contributing to the EIFD. Part of the heavy lift is the old redevelopment tax increment um, involved all the taxing entities that went into the tax increment. So school districts, special districts, the county. Um, so th that was one of the issues that made redevelopment controversial. The, um, the tax increment is that you had a lot of other entities that were contributing their share of tax of the property tax into the city's redevelopment. And so that made for somewhat of a hostile and, um, relationship with those other entities. So the requirement of the EIFD law is that A, all of the school districts and the special taxing districts are not part of that unless they voluntarily want to join. And that goes with the county as well. So one of the challenges that we had that Alana talked about was was our effort to get the county of LA um, to participate with our EIFD formation because the county's share of property tax is relatively significant and that would have made the bonding capacity of our EIFD probably double. Um, we do hope to re-engage the county to see if um, you know they would join us. Um, the the size of our EIFD is is a drop in the bucket to the to the total land area of LA County and their and what their um, property tax um, allotment is. So it really is insignificant, but uh, you know trying to you know convince them of that to for them to voluntarily join um, is a bit of a heavy lift, especially when they don't have any property involved in the EIFD boundaries. And, the, and that's the case here as well. But um, in closing, um, you know, we think it's a great economic development tool. That is why we embraced it. Um, and it does take a lot of internal communication. As Alana mentioned that you have to get your other um, departments on board. Um, initially, our finance department was somewhat skeptical because when we're talking about eliminating 50% of property tax to go into an EIFD, 
um, that 50% of, of property tax would have gone into the general fund. And most uh, cities' finance departments are extraordinarily protective of the general fund allocation. So trying to uh, get them on board and that it's not going into some special slush fund that only certain departments get to play with, um, that it really is a, a betterment for the entire community and that you know the economic growth that you you potentially are able to um, leverage actually will benefit the entire property tax basis property tax basis for uh, your city. So it's really not just um, this weird you know niche thing that uh, um, you know the finance department it may not particularly understand, but it is you know as a lot said public works parks and rec. Um, everybody is, you know, part of the city police department. Um, Covina has its own police department. And so they were heavily involved in the discussions about the EIFD in support of it. So, so the stakeholders are both internal and external or external being the um, property owners and residents of the city. Um, and so that was our experience. We have not yet ex started to incur increment because we just did adopt it. And so um, we don't, we expect that within five years we'll have enough increment to bond against the uh, the EIFD. So um, you know, again, we're, we did this as a future vision um, of future staffs being able to use this as as a tool to complement some of the other things that we're doing here in Covina. And I think that's um, our presentation, and we're available for questions. Thank you guys so much. Um, that was, wow, a wealth of knowledge um, on both fronts with those presentations. You guys got uh, a, a, a number of questions, which um, I know, Alana, you've been addressing for us in the chat box, so thank you for that. Uh, there are two that I just wanted to call out. Um, uh, Joel uh, had questions about uh, layering um, and bundling incentives within the context of opportunity zones. EIFDs that have been created. And so looking um, to see if there are examples out there um, that we could share that have successfully bundled those. And, and I don't know if anyone is able to address that on uh, our speaker panel today, but um, GoBiz has been tracking this across the state, Joel. So we could um, also seek back up with you with um, specialists on our own to uh, you know, explore that with you and share what we, what we understand and know. Um, but does anyone else on the, um, uh, any one of our other speakers have wanted to address that question too? Well, from the Covina perspective, I mean, we didn't bundle it, I guess, um, if I'm understanding the question is that is, are, are there other plans or, you know, you know, other things that involve, it was our, our specific plan that was layered um, underneath, I guess, if you will, the boundaries of the EIFD. So in that regard, you know, if you want to call that a bundle, um, that's what we did, e even though this downtown specific plan didn't have an economic engine component of it. It wasn't other than it, trying to attract development and attract users as far as, um, you know, zoning incentives, if you will, the de development standard incentives. So that, along with the boundaries of the EIFD would be what, from Covina's perspective, would be a, a bundle, if you will. Thank you for that, Brian. Um, oh, sorry. Anyone else want to intersect? Okay. Um, the other question, real quick, because we've got to get to our other speaker. Um, there's a question if there's an organization that supports the creation of EIFDs in Northern California. California. David, do you have any particular awareness on that front? Um, I'm not aware of a specific organization that supports EIFDs in Northern California, but I can look into it and get back if there's going to be um, an opportunity to send out answers after the webinar. Absolutely. We are um, uh, notating all these questions on our end, too, um, and so we can follow up accordingly with um, the, the attendees that have asked, are asked these questions. All right, perfect, thank you. Okay, we are going to uh, move along to our next uh, presenter. I know there are still a couple of open-ended questions in our Q&A chat box, so um, speakers,
from the last session, if you don't mind taking a look at those and seeing if you can address them um, in, in typing in your answers, that would be great. Um, otherwise, we can follow up accordingly in the aftermath to help address these questions. Um, so uh, moving along to our last and final speaker, uh, we have John King, Director of Community Engagement at HACLA, or the Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles. And John's going to be walking us through the revitalization work of the Jordan Downs Community Center project. Uh, take it away. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is John King, as mentioned, I'm Director of Community Engagement, and I'll be sharing an update regarding uh, the Jordan Downs redevelopment under the context of the larger Watts Rising initiative that the Housing Authority of the City of LA is undertaking currently. So when we say Watts Rising, we're talking about um, this initiative that includes uh, the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative, which is a HUD funded uh, program that we have $35 million grant for, as well as many of you are familiar with the Transformative Climate Communities Grant. We were one of the first recipients of the grant a few years back. And so TCC and CNI kind of come together to help us with the Watts Rising Initiative and its primary objective was to redevelop Jordan Downs, but as these initiatives um, have key um, guidelines to really engage and invest in the broader community. And so as the Housing Authority of the City of LA, the second largest housing authority in the nation, we have uh, about 60,000 housing choice vouchers that we administer in the city of LA, about 6,500 public housing units, another 2,000 units or so under our asset management portfolio. And we do a lot of work with the mayor's office to uh, address homeless initiatives in the city of LA. And so um, as we go forward here, the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative properly uh, under the HUD funding has three components, housing, people, and neighborhood. And so uh, under our People Initiative, the Children's Institute is our lead partner. Uh, they've been around Los Angeles uh, for almost 100 years, providing services and programs uh, for residents. Uh, our housing um, component is led by our Jordan Downs community partners, which is the housing authority and a few developer partners, uh, Bridge Housing, as well as the Michaels organization. And then we have uh, the neighborhood initiatives, uh, which are led by the mayor's office of economic opportunity and so as you can see there's a great partnership here so both for cni and the transformative climate communities we partner these key folks to help lead this effort as we call watts rising so under the people plan the focus is improving outcomes in these three areas health employment and training and youth education we look to improve uh, life expectancy rates in Watts. Uh, there was a study done a few years back um, and Watts was determined to be one of the, the areas in the entire state that had the lowest life expectancy, uh, some of the highest crime rates and the lowest educational attainment. So it's clearly one of the most underserved communities uh, in California. And so um, it's very important to us as we look to bring investment to address all these concerns, decrease violence, uh, look at bringing equity and education and higher opportunities. Under the housing component of this grant, we're looking to develop 1,400, uh, I think the number has actually gone up a little bit now, uh, in the neighborhood of 1,400 units. Uh, we're doing one for one replacement of the existing public housing units, which was 700. Um, we'll have some home ownership and a level of uh, market rate, but it will primarily be an affordable housing development, which we're making some significant progress on. Uh, under the neighborhood initiative, there's some neighborhood level investments that we've kind of categorized in three areas, healthy connections, encouraging roots, and realizing a vision. And so um, as we go forward, we'll talk a little bit about some of these investments that are happening. Um, these are all leveraged and augmented both by the TCC grant and the CNI. So some of these went specifically into the CNI application where we leveraged uh, existing resources. And then as TCC came about, we're able to leverage and enhance many of these initiatives through, through this and uh, really makes for much better uh, initiatives and progress. So I have a quick video that'll show you here, that'll show you some of the great progress we've made since two, 2017 on the physical redevelopment at Jordan Downs. Yeah.
This is a 21 acre vacant site that the housing authority purchased uh, that is directly adjacent to the public housing and you can you see the progress over the years there. Bridge and Michaels are the two development teams on either side of that main central boulevard. They have a contract to develop either side of the project. So this uh, current area you're looking at the bottom is just actually recently completed. Residents have moved into that phase it's just this past weekend. So we're a little behind on updating the video, but as you can see, um, there's a lot of progress being made. So this area here will be a part of the new uh, park and the community center that you saw uh on the first part of the video so it just gives you some kind of view and context of where we are uh and the progress that's been made second here um and so just give you additional context um the video started with this 21 acre uh parcel the housing authority purchased that parcel in 2008 uh and so as you can see here, Jordan Down surrounds that parcel with Jordan High School there in the yellow. And so this is kind of the initial development area uh, that we started with. And a part of that, you know, Jordan Downs was initially built in the 40s and 50s, first war worker housing and then converted to public housing, 700 units, initially 2,300 residents. Uh, really detached from the larger community, underserved by retail. And so a part of our vision and goals were to really address that. And so we work with the community to develop a master plan uh, in a specific plan with the city to create uh, 1,500 units of mixed income housing, one for one replacement, robust job training and social service platform, an extension of Century Boulevard. Any guys ever been to Los Angeles? Century Boulevard is the street you leave on from the airport. And it used to end right at Jordan Downs as you continue uh, east. And so now we've extended that through the property and it goes on through the South Gate. Um, 115,000 square foot retail center and nine acres of open space. Um, uh, one of the, some of the key features I think that are important is really build first. So that 21 acre parcel allowed us to build first and thereby not having to displace the resident. Um, one of the key things is uh, in introducing this project to the community is where the resident's going to go. Are they going to be able to come back? And so um, it was great to be able to build first. And many of the residents got to watch their new units being built before their eyes and literally moved into right across the street there. And so that was very important to us. And uh, we, we're making significant progress, as you can see on the video there. Uh, so one of the very key components of our initiative was community engagement. Congresswoman Maxine Waters in 2008, where we were discussing uh, in contemplating this idea of purchasing the land there and creating this redevelopment project instructed us to establish a community uh, advisory committee that was a cross section of community members and residents to ensure that there was maximum community participation and resident engagement into being a part of developing the vision for Jordan Downs as well as 
providing input and being really well educated on how they were involved in their, uh, you know, our commitment to them. So literally hundreds of meetings, surveys, outreach, a lot that has taken place over the years, uh, backyard briefings, um, you know, sometimes as you go and you uh, year after year uh, doing things, they begin to put labels on the work that you do. And so now the, the really uh, sexy label is uh, trauma-informed community engagement. And so we've been doing that a long time as we have made adjustments and understood uh, kind of some of the things that our residents have dealt with, this distrust for government, uh, broken promises, uh, a lot of things that have happened. And so it's really about establishing trust, uh, working with the residents and meeting them where they are. And so we've done a lot of things to uh, really help foster that. One of our key initiatives is the community coach program. And essentially we have a group of residents who assist us with outreach and engagement. They receive a monthly stipend. Uh, they are the most informed residents at the site. Um, they have multiple meetings with them. They help us understand the concerns of the residents. If the meeting went well, if we need to change the format, if we're, all these things, it's been a very key tool uh, to really engaging the community and ensuring that we have maximum participation. And so we've had this program up now for at least 10 years now as a part of this uh, redevelopment. And it's been extremely beneficial to us. A um, lot of feedback that went into uh, getting us to where we are. Uh, the advisory committee, we did a six city um, study tour where we went to different uh, cities where redevelopment of public housing had happened to talk to other residents and other stakeholders to really understand what the future could hold. And all that went into uh, the master plan of Jordan Downs. So I want to kind of give you a big picture about the phasing and how things are going. We, we talked about the 71, 71 acres total, 700 public housing units. And so what you see here are these color coded areas where things that have been completed, things are in progress and finance and uh, the future. Um, and so this green area uh, is sep separated and it's about 39% of the total resident units thus far. Um, we, um, one of the big things people always said, are you going to change the name of Jordan Downs as a part of this redevelopment? It's a, uh, it has, depending on your perspective, um, people wanted the name changed and a lot of community members said don't change. So what we did is each phase, we give it a name, but we say at Jordan Downs. So Cedar Grove at Jordan Downs, New Harvest at Jordan Downs, Oak Terrace at Jordan Downs. And so we have the best of both worlds. And so you can see um, there are a lot of uh, units that have been completed. One C I like to draw your attention to at the top, that's the retail center called Freedom Plaza, which is complete. There are 18 stores there. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on, but it's it's uh, running, it's thriving. It's a Starbucks, Nike store, Habit Burger, Ross Dress for Less, Smart and Final Extra. Uh, there's two banks there. This is something that was just on a vacant factory site that the housing authority purchased and to see that come to fruition is really, really exciting. Uh, and the community is very, very excited as well. We have some other phases under construction, 19% um, of uh, residential projects. Uh, and so we have these names, S2, H2, and all these things uh, don't mean a lot to you until, um, especially if you're a community member, until you know that it's named and you know uh, that you're moving in. But one of the things I want to uh, also speak to as and we have uh, funding lined up for some of these future phases we're looking at with our developer partners. And uh, I want to talk about this, uh, that, that's very strange looking. Because we did build first, we're able to, and I spoke to this earlier, to residents to be able to move and stay on site. And we only demolish units once the residents moved into a new phase. This is very important for us. Um, and the resident, we have a partner, Dale Richardson Associates, uh, as a relocation consultant, and they work directly with the residents to ensure they have all the information and are prepared to move at the appropriate time. And so this has been a puzzle, but it's it's been uh, beneficial because traditionally and historically in public housing redevelopment, the residents had to move away 
and many um, weren't able to come back. And so to this day, people who are not familiar with this project believe that we moved all the residents out and they're in Palmdale, Lancaster and other um, you know, neighboring counties and, and won't ever get a chance to come back, which is totally the opposite. Most of the residents actually stayed and are able, were able to move right into uh, new units. Um, Julie wanted to talk a little bit about some of the financing sources and uh, Julie, you wanna? <clears throat> Yes, good morning. Um, so um, this project has obviously um, has great implications in terms of just uh, economic development and redevelopment in this particular area because it has not seen a lot of investment from any kind of uh, uh, sources out there. It is in an opportunity zone, but we have not we have yet to attract uh, potential investors uh, that would benefit from that. So in addition to that, as John mentioned, uh, these buildings were built uh, in, the early, uh, in the early 40s. The infrastructure has not been upgraded for a long time. So part of, part of our scope is not only to build the housing, but also to upgrade the infrastructure. Um, so funding has been uh, a, somewhat of a challenge, but we we're about 50% of the way through. Um, and most of the funding sources that we've typically utilized, you know, go along the lines of most affordable housing funding sources, your tax credits, you know, taxes and bonds and traditional permanent financing offered by conventional lenders. Um, we do not uh, sell the property to the developers that we work with, but operate with a long-term ground lease uh, that allows us to retain ownership of the property. Um, and then in addition to that, we do use uh, uh, Section 8 or subsidies uh, to subsidize the operations uh, because a lot of times the, uh, the affordability of these units are quite low and you have to supplement it with the subsidies to actually make it financially feasible. So if we have the PBV Section 8 vouchers and RAD, for those of you that are not familiar with RAD, RAD refers to a uh, rental assistance uh, demonstration program that has been implemented by HUD to assist public housing uh, authorities uh, to convert from the public housing model to more of a Section 8 sort of platform where you're not dependent on congressional allocation annually to uh, to run the public housing, but rather to convert it into sort of the sex, a Section 8 platform where it's voucher driven, basically, but it's basically project-based vouchers. Um, so that's rad. And then John touched a little bit, actually a lot, on the CNI, the Choice Neighborhood Initiative, which is uh, HUD funded. And I want to talk about HCD a, a little bit because there really have been um, sort of a saving grace for us because uh, uh, sources of gap financing to make these projects work, especially when you have 19 phases uh, that you have to finance over a period of time, um, the, gap, the source of gap funding is really important. So HCD, uh, through all their various programs, we've been able to tap into a lot of their programs. TCC was, uh, was wonderful, um, and ASIC, uh, as well as the Infill Infrastructure Grants, which has really helped us in terms of financing the infrastructure out there. And then uh, MHP funds uh, for for gap financing, which you know they they more or less dictate that you um, that you cater to the lower uh, AMI households, which which is fine because uh, that's primarily the the target that we are dealing with out there. So 
So HCD has been, and I did, I think there's another slide there, but um, you know, the rest of it is, is yeah, there you go. So, so the, you know, the importance of the, what we've been able to tap into HCD, as you can see the state, uh, we've received about $89 million, about 15% of the gap financing that or to make these projects feasible, we've gone from the state. And, you know, the rest of it, the bulk of it is, uh, you know, federal and state tax credits, uh, a typical funding source for affordable housing. And then HACLA has also put in gap financing uh, when needed. But this this table shows you how we've been able to, to leverage all the different funding sources uh, uh, to make it work, which has been extremely helpful. We're 50% of the way through. We've invested close to $600, $600 million into the project. And uh, at the end of the day, I think this overall project will probably, will probably be close to about $1.5 uh, dollars invested in a community. Julie, I apologize. It seems like you may have gone on mute. Yeah, um, I, I when, thought that was me. Yeah, when did I go on mute? I, no, I'm not quite it wasn't, sure. It wasn't too long ago. But I did want to let you know, Julie, we, we only have five minutes left. Yeah, so I'm going to No, that's it. Yeah. Okay. So the other, thanks, Julie. The other few things I wanted to mention, and, and we'll send out this presentation uh, to Brian so he can get it out. This is slightly different than one I sent you earlier in the week. But one of the key things is local hire. Uh, Section 3 is kind of the terminology used under the HUD um, guidelines. But um, from the very beginning, it was very important to us to have our residents and community members participate in this redevelopment. And so for section hires today, there have been 991 folks uh, that have been hired, uh, both our Jordan Downs residents, Watts residents, and City of LA residents. So this is important, important for us, the developers, and the general contractors, uh, to ensure that um, we have this. We also have a work source center, um, workforce development program, and so we've been a we have been able to help prepare our residents to um, participate uh, in this and uh, pre apprenticeship programs and other things. And, and so this has been very important to us. It's something that um, has been very helpful um, and continues to be. Um, under the Watts Rising Choice Neighborhoods, also there's a people plan, which relates to investments and in people. I talked about the Children's Institute being um, overseeing that early on. I talked about in, uh, income and employment, health, early learning, and education. They have a three-tier system in engaging our residents in terms of service navigation, care coordination in Tier 2, and really for those residents that have really deep needs um, they are able to connect them to mental health services. And so this is very important. In one of the very early community meetings we had, one of our residents said, you know, this is great, but you, you really can't invest in this property unless you're also investing in the people. And I think HUD gets that, and the Housing Authority has bought into that from early on. And so this speaks to some of the partners we have in some of these areas, Altamed, Cedar sinai Kaiser Permanente, under education um, Boys and Girls Club uh, Partnership for Los Angeles Schools College Track. So we work with a lot of different organizations to help achieve uh, our people goals. Um, we're going to talk about some of the neighborhood level investments again. Um, we'll get into just a few more with a few minutes. I'll just kind of show you some of the key things we have. Uh, this is uh, some photos of Freedom Plaza. This is the, the shopping center that's right there uh, on the edge of the property that we purchased. And uh, it's it's beautiful and uh, it's very exciting to see. Um, under Healthy Connections, we have a creative school signage program. Um, we're working with some of the schools to create um, different signage for kids at and as they come to school to help encourage them, motivate them towards school. Um, we have a uh, kitchen incubator with uh, Mudtown Farms. And so we're looking at how we bring in one of the requirements under the Choice Neighborhoods uh, program is that the city allocate 10% of the CDBG allocation to the neighborhood that's designated um, as a CNI uh, project. And so um, this is a combination of, you know, Choice Neighborhoods dollars, CDBG dollars, 
Um, there's a Watts Empowerment Music and Film Studio that we got some funds to help support. Um, there's a Watts Cultural Trail, utilizing some of the CDBG funds to enhance this cultural trail, um, some great artwork and other things that are happening. Watts Cool Schools, tree planting and cool pavement uh, at some of the schools there under Encouraging Roots. Um, we have a, so a resilient homes initiative. So we utilize the Choice Neighborhoods Funds also as leveraged by the TCC grant um, that's not listed here, but for sol free solar panels and energy retrofits and green model homes. And so all of this is taking place in Watts uh, as we speak. Uh, there's some other kind of local nonprofits um, that were able to benefit from this. The Watts Latino organization, it does a lot in the community. We're looking to support um, their facility there. Um, we're also looking at Greening Watts. Um, there, as a part of between CNI and TCC, over 3,000 trees we planted and, uh, in Watts, and, and much of that is underway. Uh, our, business, our town business improvements, um, there are 15 facade improvements um, that we'll be able to do through these funds. Um, Bob, yes. Thank you. We're going to make sure we share your slides with all this great information. You guys are doing a lot. This is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Out of yeah. time, unfortunately. Um, all right. I try, I try my best to get through it, but there's a lot yeah. happening, and, uh, and we'll share this with everyone. Um, there's some other things. And this is the last slide. Essentially, I'll say in the right... Uh, here where the orange is, that's where Jordan Downs is proper. And because of our the housing authority's effort to invest in Jordan Downs and redevelop it, we've been able to impact the broader Watts community with all these green dots that you see uh, through, um, you know, the investments through TCC, CNI and other things. And so uh, the rising tide does float all boats and, and, and assist the larger community and the housing authority is uh, working through that. So thank you all very much. We appreciate it. Uh, being able to be here, and uh, I will send this over to Brian so we can get out. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you both, John and Julie. Appreciate you guys and all the effort you're doing. And to all of our speakers, thank you. Um, and the partner agencies that you guys have been working with for the work you do in economic development every day to lead and drive these very important places. Programs. So thank you guys for all of that. At GoBiz, we appreciate everyone's interest in this annual webinar series and look forward to further collaborating with you all and sharing best practices um, in the future. Um, so we wish you all a very happy holidays and look forward to seeing you all again in the new year. Again, we will be sharing the recording of this webinar in the next coming weeks here and um, we will be following up with those who asked questions that didn't get those answered as well. So please look out for that too. Thank you everyone, happy holidays. Thank you.